Hello everyone and welcome to Human Stories. My name is Gloria Perez Rivera. I am a PhD candidate at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and an incoming postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Anthropology at the University of Toronto, Scarborough. Um, in general, my work, my research work, examines formal and informal credit and debt relations in the lives of forcibly displaced people in Colombia, so people that used to be farmers and during the Colombian conflict, they have been forced to relocate to cities and um, because of the precarious situation, they have been uh, entangled in credit and debt relations of different sorts once they arrive to the city. I also have a new project in which I examine the credit and debt relations that migrants, Latin American migrants, establish to finance their migration to Canada. So in a, in a more general way, I, I, I focus on how the processes of making a living in the lives of these internal migrants or international migrants, people enter into credit and debt relations that often are exploitative, but that also enable them to succeed, to make a living and to support their families. The, the talk that I would like to, uh, the presentation that I would like to um, have for you today is titled Narco-Trafficking in Formal Work and Food Security. Um, the, the stories that, I, that I'm going to share with you today or the content of the presentation comes from the stories that displaced people uh, told me when I was living in Cartagena and from my observations during my work there, I, I did, did 17 months of work between 2015 and 2018. And, and during that time, I found that in the absence of uh, regulated forms of credits, for, for example, microcredit uh, institutions or microfinance institutions and banks, uh, loans that may be offered to, to poor populations in other places in the country, in, in Cartagena, these forms of regulated credit were almost unexistent. Also, displaced people as victims of the conflict, the government, the government has promised them certain forms of economic redress, but, but that form of redress uh, have materialized only in the lives of very few uh, families. So in, in general, displaced people have arrived to the city with no money, no material assets, no property, and a lack of affordable and regulated credit. It is in that, in that context that narco-paramilitary creditors have created and developed a very extensive credit system that by now is about two or three decades old, depending on which place of Colombia you, you look at it, and that offers small loans to poor people across the country. These loans both launder money from narco trafficking business uh, and make and, and collect profit from interest for, um, from which the narco traffickers benefit additionally to the money laundering procedure. So um, in one of the neighborhoods where I did my field work is a neighborhood that I call La Fantastica and about 120,000 people live there, the majority of whom are displaced people and that used to be farmers in rural Colombia and that during the conflict they have relocated there by the government. The government has uh, purchased these houses or apartments from contractors that build them for, for them, for the, for the state. The state purchased the, the, the houses and then uh, allocate them to, to displaced people. So that's how people came to live in La, in La Fantastica. So displaced people, as most of uh, the people that live in the global south, make a living from the so-called informal economy. So these, these are forms of work that are extremely flexible and precarious, often very exploitative, but that is the only option that they have uh, upon relocation to, to the city. And, and the loans that narco paramilitaries provide to them are mostly used to buy raw materials or to buy products outside, outside of the neighborhoods that they can resell to uh, people that live nearby them. So let me, um, one of the reasons why generating an income is difficult for displaced people is because La Fantastica was built outside of the city. So it's 
in the very, very periphery of the urban core. And uh, coming to work or finding a job in the city becomes expensive because the fares are, are expensive and because also the infrastructure of the neighborhood is very precarious. So very few uh, bus lines service the neighborhood. They, uh, they stop working very early in the, in the evening. So people that find a job in the city may have problems coming back to home. Also, uh, there are not enough schools, not enough daycares, and other people are forced to stay home to work from there and, and to take care of kids. So most of the people, of my interlocutors, displaced people, they make a living making food from their homes to sell to the neighborhoods. Other people um, go to, to the city or to the city market and buy some products and come and resell it to, to neighbors. But to be able to sell something in the neighborhood, people need to have some cash to buy the raw materials or the products in the market. And that is how the narco-paramilitary predators have uh, made these populations poor people, or uh, in this case, displaced people as part of the, the, the people that make uh, um, very small incomes. Uh, a family of displaced people usually uh, subsist with seven American dollars a day in, in Colombian pesos, obviously. So a family of five people. So the incomes are really low. So the displaced people that have arrived to the city with no money and no material assets and uh, no access to bank have to borrow money from, from the only people that offer credit to them, which are these narco paramilitary lenders. They go across the neighborhoods and they distribute these business cards that you see there with a phone number where you can call them, text them. A lot of them use WhatsApp. People request the, the, the loan and they come and distribute the loans door by door. So the way in which the, the credit works is that um, the loans are very small. They go from 20 to $100. The interest rate is 20% a month. And, and the loan is only for a month. That means that if, you, if a person borrows $20, by the end of the month, you have to repay the $20 plus the interest. Uh, the narco-paramilitary creditors make sure that people repay in this way because they collect the debt installments by day. So every single day towards the end of the day when people are um, done working, so done selling their tamales or empanadas or rice or soup, the collector comes and, and gets the payment for that day. So for a $20 loan, we are talking about that th these collectors come and pick up about a dollar a day every single day for, for a month until the, the, the debt is paid. But um, how is it then that, that, what is the relation between the money laundering, the food security and the subsistence of people? Well, so uh, there is a very well established cycle in which the money circulates in these neighborhoods between credit work and, and, the, and the provision of services and sales that, that people do to, to generate income. And it goes in, in the way that I'm going to tell you um, in, the, in the next part of the talk. So usually displaced people buy the, the raw materials and the food to feed their families at corner stores. These corner stores that are, all, that are also owned by narco-paramilitaries uh, have tabs for families. So, so people can buy small amounts of rice or small amounts of uh, chicken, beans, oil, condiments uh, per day and put them on a, on a credit tab. At the end of the month, they have to repay. So the way that it works is that in the morning, someone comes and asks the person at the corner store the, for, the, for the raw materials that they need to make, say, empanadas or two knowers for that day. With those materials, they go they produce, they start selling, and um, at the end of the day, they repay the installment of the gota gota. With that money, they also may purchase in cash the, the food that they need to feed the family, or when there is nothing left, well, they, they may feed the family some of the products that they made for, for selling. So anyway, uh, the bottom line is that from 
every single state profit, the first thing that people put aside is the money to repay the credit. At the end of the month, they have finished paying the narcoparamilitary credit, and then they request a new loan of $20, $50. And with those $20 or $50, they repay the money to the corner store. And the cycle starts again, so they can start producing again for the month. So this is how um, the, the narcoparamilitary credit is it's embedded in the local economy of these neighborhoods. To the point that if there is no narcoparamilitary loans, many displaced households could not work, could not generate income, and could not eat at the end of the day. So in turn, these, these tiny loans of $20, $50, $100 make possible the local business and the local subsistence of these of these neighborhoods because in if if someone is able to uh, produce uh, some income from selling rice, that person can also buy soup from the other neighbor or oranges from the neighbor on the other side of the uh, of the house. So so this is how the 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 local neighborhood, the local market keeps going as as long as people are able to pay one dollar per day in, in principal and interest, the, the narcoparamilitary lenders distribute loans to, to pretty much anyone that can sell something. And in this way, they profit extracting high interest from people, but also allow people to at least feed their families with rice and plantains. So, um, this, this is how narco-trafficking then something that seems quite separate from when uh, we consider what food security and, and how um, informal economies and local economies specifically, specifically at neighborhood level work. During the pandemic, collectors are informal workers as well. And although they work for narco-paramilitary moneylenders, they still have to make a living every day from their activity, which is distribute loans. So they keep going outside and distribute credits. And they are able to do that because the workers, the informal workers, cannot afford to stay home. Because if you don't make $5 or $10 a day, then uh, your family will not eat. So this is how, uh, during the pandemic, those people that have managed to keep selling their soup or their rice, they still can access the money that the, the narco-trafficking narco uh, lenders have uh, for them. Obviously, a lot of people have defaulted because the situation is, is very complex right now, but uh, because the loans are so small, uh, people in reality can have many strategies to, to repay the little loans so they go back to the good books with the narco money lenders and they can keep uh, accessing these small loans. Eventually, and this happens quite often, people have to borrow from one money lender to cover another money lender, and that, that is where things become a little bit complicated. And eventually, people may be outside of the, uh, may, may be like push uh, from, the, from the credit system because the money lenders will not uh, provide credit anymore because they have defaulted so many times or because they have been borrowed from different, different ones to core. Um, different credits here and there. So anyway, uh, in this brief talk, I, I wanted us to reflect about this um, situation. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I you know, I sometimes...